Okay, welcome to Cordwell Children and our Autism Awareness Week podcast and Cordwell Children's first ever podcast. So it's a, it's a special moment for Cordwell Children and we've got an esteemed group of people here to join in for our Autism Awareness Week conversation. So if we could just introduce ourselves, Alex, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, um, I'm Alex Manners. I've got Asperger's, which I was diagnosed with when I was 10 and I'm now 22. Okay, Charlie? I'm Charlie Baswick, mum to twins, Oliver and Harry, and Harry does have autism. And Matt? And I'm Matt Johnson, I'm a clinical psychologist and director of clinical services and research here at Cordwell. Fantastic, thank you all so much for thank taking you. the time out to come and join us and joining in with this uh, interesting conversation. So let's kick it off. Um, we're here because uh, of Autism Awareness Week and to recognise this special week in the calendar. And I'm interested to know how you all feel about um, how the uh, the current general's, uh, general public's perception of autism has changed over the last years. So Alex, if we could start with you. Yeah, so I think, I think nowadays there's a lot more awareness for autism and what I've got Asperger's than there was sort of, say, 10 years ago, say when I was diagnosed. But I still think there's a lot of sort of preconceived ideas about what autism is and what Asperger's is. And, and from my own experiences, a lot of people kind of, they have generalised ideas about people with autism you know, their traits are this, this and this. And because everyone with autism is so different, some of the things, you know, some people say to me, or I would never have known you had autism, for example, because I can hold down a conversation quite well. Mm. Um, and that's one of the things that people think, oh, people with autism can't hold down a conversation. So there is a lot more uh, awareness for it now than, than there was, say, 10 years ago. But I think there's still a long way to go to, to raise awareness. It must be a hard, uh, Matt, coming from a kind of clinical perspective where you've got this kind of description of what autism is but as Alex says it's it's not one thing is it? Absolutely and it, that's the real challenge I think for any kind of team involved in assessment and diagnosis because everyone is a unique individual and that is always our starting point for the work that we do is we need to understand the individual child you know their strengths their uniqueness as an individual and then see what autistic traits they may or may not have, whether there's enough of those to actually then give that additional diagnosis and that label, which it's really important, as you say, that we kind of separate out uh, the individual in that because it is there is no sort of diagnostic test that will give you a definite answer. Ultimately, it's about bringing all the pieces of the puzzle together, really understanding that child, and then trying to sort of make a, a consensus judgment about whether you know, the difficulties that that child presents would actually meet the criteria for a diagnosis, which is not always easy at all, as you say. And Charlie, you've been talking about uh, Harry's autism for quite a while. Have you noticed that there's been any change over the last few years? I think years ago people just assumed autism was a childhood disorder that people would either grow out of or they kind of forgot that those children would one day then become adults. And I think there is now a lot more recognition and awareness that adults present with autism as well. Um, but, you know, as everybody said, I think there's still a long way to go. But I think you know, sort of celebrities like Chris Packham have spoken out about his Asperger's. And I think that was a really powerful, positive documentary that he did in terms of making people realise the strengths and the, and the things that people add as well to society, opposed to seeing autism as a deficit. So I think that there is definite a shift, but I think there's still a long way we could go. I think that's a really interesting point. I know, I know we've all uh, you've all touched on it, but that that perception of strength versus deficit and people being able to recognize that autism brings uh, strengths with it as well as challenges and do you think people are are starting to see that rather than it just you know being seen as a as a medical condition or or something that they have to uh, that has to be diagnosed and then looked at by in a medical environment instead of saying you know this is somebody's personality and this is what they bring to society and for me i think that's where the media has played a really positive role over the last few years because it has identified individuals like chris packham and anyone who watched i'm a celebrity obviously be aware that Anne hegarty was you know, very much a feature of that program and these are individuals who obviously have real talents and real strengths and abilities and you, you know you could argue that Anne's inherent intellectual ability is partly because of her autism and you know she was very open about that on the program and I think that really raises people's awareness that oh actually you know although she's got this this label that people assume to be a problem actually she's got some real strengths as well and I think the, the media has played a really positive role in actually highlighting that over the last few years I think there's certainly more to be done I think particularly for that group of individuals who perhaps 
aren't as able as people like Anne. You know, there's lots of children, young people and adults who actually really struggle cognitively. You know, they struggle with activities of daily living. They struggle to understand and make sense of the world. And I think the media has done a great job of highlighting really able individuals, the media, the celebrity that we can all sort of identify with. And that's fantastic for raising awareness of autism. But we mustn't forget that there's lots of children and young people who don't have those strengths and abilities that actually do need just as much awareness raising as well. Yeah, good point. Uh, and talking about media uh, brings us on neatly to the uh, the next area that I'd like to to talk about, and that is the media's role and some of the programmes that have featured autism over uh, recent weeks and months. And it's interesting that we've got Alex here who's recently featured on one of those. And um, so, first of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience on TV? Yeah, so um, one of the reasons I was on um, the recent series of the Endatables. And one of the reasons I wanted to go on, um, obviously, was to find love, find possibly someone I can spend, you know, have a re relationship with. But also, it was to raise awareness for Asperger's and autism, and actually to show that actually, yes, there are loads of challenges with having Asperger's, um, and even the challenges I used to have at school when I was younger, I still have a lot of those challenges, but I'm able to now cope with them a lot better. So I found ways of, um, you know, ways of helping to, me to calm down when I'm stressed or having a meltdown. But also, I look upon it as something positive, and that's something that I want to portray to other people, that actually there are many positive elements uh, of having Asperger's uh, okay. and, and, and having autism. It's not all, you know, it's not all just challenges and struggles. And did the programme help you do that? It did, because, I mean, during the programme I spoke about my time at school. So, as well as, you know, speaking about how positively I look upon it, I did also highlight the challenges that I faced, particularly at school, um, because I had a lot of challenges at school. And it was fantastic that, you know, people with autism are able to almost have a voice and are able to speak about their autism in from their own personal experiences. Because, like you mentioned, everyone with autism has different experiences. So to highlight everyone's, as many people as possible's different experiences just raises more awareness for the condition and autism as a whole. I think my concern with, with programmes like Undatables, and it'll be in, your take on this will be really interesting, is that because it is snapshots of real life, I think what the public then see is very much down to the editor and what they decide to include. Um, and then you sort of then, it's the editor's decision as to how much of your personality everybody else can see. And obviously they're in it for the ratings and they're in it for you know, viewing figures and things like that. And so for me, when I'm watching that, I am conscious that there's a real life backstory and how much of that are we actually seeing um, and I know that, you know, there have been other sort of well-known faces on, on datables that people have really taken to their heart. But I th and I think it has raised awareness, but I think that's a byproduct of the entertainment factor. And that kind of worried me a little bit. So I don't know what your experience was of how true they were to your story. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of my family, um, some had watched quite a lot of the programmes and the episodes, and some of them hadn't really watched much of it. And I think some of their own personal, sort of their first reaction of me going on the show was, oh, you're not unendatable, you're, you can perfectly get a girlfriend, you know. But then I always say to them, well, the show, actually, in the titles, they knock the un bit off, so it then reads datables. Mm. And I think it's a programme, in my opinion, to highlight that actually these people, you know, can find love and can prosper. Because a lot of people who go on the show have already had a number of um, relationships. So it's not just people going on the show who can't get a relationship or have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It's actually a number of factors of actually, yes, these people can find love, they just might find it a little bit more challenging than the average everyday person who maybe doesn't have um, Asperger's or autism. There's a topical issue which uh, kind of crosses across both and that's the amount of support that shows offer to people that, uh, that appear on them and I'm interested to know how much support you got from, from going on there because it sounds like you had a very positive experience, but that might not be the case for everybody. And with a with a production team, was it was it was the support there for you? Yeah, they were they were very supportive. I could sort of call them up whenever I had a problem or a worry. Um, and also, if I didn't want certain things to be filmed, um, you know, they were very open to saying, "Look, if you don't want us to film certain things that we might want to film, um, you know, you can just tell us, and we won't film those things." So they were very very uh, conscious of actually portraying me in a in a good way and, and not filming anything that I felt uncomfortable with. So they were really very, very, very good about that. And that, I think The Undateables is, uh, is an example of, uh, of a show that is 
you know, trying to show strengths. Whereas um, I'd be interested from your point um, and you, Matt, what you thought of the A word, whether you watched the A word and what you thought of it. I only watched the first episode and then got completely side. So I watched the first one mm-hmm. and then forgot to see his link. So I do need to go back and, and catch up. But yeah, the first episode I loved. Um, I thought it was quite raw. Um, and I liked that it was a family drama with a disability in it, opposed to a disabled drama. Yeah. Um, so I did like that it kind of it showed lots of different aspects of how it affects a family. And certainly that was a, a similar experience for me in terms of all those textbook, I'm sure, reactions of denial and, um, and anger and frustration. Um, so yeah, I thought programs like that do go a long way in helping people understand the process around a child with a diagnosis or an adult with a diagnosis. Yeah, and similarly, I, I, I've not seen every episode, but I've seen enough to kind of get a, a feel for the programme and understand what, what they were trying to do with that. I think it, it portrays, you know, a, a very sort of realistic view, I think, of, uh, of autism in, a, in a, a fairly typical family, obviously with lots of the sort of stereotypical reactions, as you say, but, you know, it's a drama, so it's got to try and, mm-hmm. you know, crystallise everything and kind of show, you know, the real sort of human emotion side of that in, in a very short time frame. So it's obviously doing it in a very sort of compartmentalised way, but I think it provided a very good sort of overview of the kind of key difficulties and showing things from different perspectives as well, you know, within the family, mum, dad, you know, the child, it gives, it gives those different viewpoints, which I think is really important to get across. And a very different take, obviously, from things like from data sports, where, which is really interesting because there's a programme that's actually created the first sort of celebrities of people with autism. You know, we've not had that before. So that's, that's a kind of a new sort of strand to the celebrity world. And as you say, very topical issue in terms of how people cope with celebrity when people have been on shows like that and the support that people might might need. Think about characters like Daniel, for example, who's mm. you know, been through a few a few seasons now and had his own special on, on, on Datables as well. Um, you know, he's very much in the limelight. And it'd be interesting to see how that sort of pans out, having sort of autistic celebrities uh, on the media as well now. I think what's what's interesting with both types of media, whether it's a, a factual dramatisation or whether it's a, an undateables type, is that they just encourage that conversation. Mm. Whether people love them or loathe them, either way, it just gets the word out there. It encourages conversation, discussion around stereotypes, preconceived ideas. And I think that in itself is really valuable. So I think whether you love them or hate them, that in itself, you know, sort of creates a conversation that's really yeah. necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm interested to know, uh, because I'm not sure that even though these uh, it's in the media a lot more, there's a lot more awareness around autism, I think how people understand autism, uh, because it is so complex and so individual, is still very difficult. Um, I, you know, I just came from a, a meeting to here where somebody still wanted me to explain autism and, uh, you know, I'm not in a position to be able to do that. So I'm, un- I'm interested to know how, when somebody asks you quest- uh, that question, what is autism or what is Asperger's and how does it affect your life, what do you say? I mean, I always, the first thing I always, always say to someone if they ask me what is Asperger's or what is autism is I say, first thing you, anyone should know is that everyone with autism is different. So one thing that I may struggle with, you know, maybe the one thing that someone else um, finds re- really helpful to cope with their challenges, but also um, we can operate at a quite a high level of stress. So very small incidents that most people probably wouldn't even think twice about um, can lead us to, to becoming really stressed or having a meltdown. Um, but also, you know, things like everyday noises and sounds um, are very sort of um, we struggle a lot more with like the sensory elements, so noises, sounds, so the feel of certain objects, and that can lead us to what we call a sensory overload. But there's also like a number of other things uh, typically with autism, and again, everyone is so different. Things like we have a specialist subject that we might be absolutely um, obsessed with and want to know everything about. Um, also, <clears throat> things like we might not like crowded spaces. So there's loads of different elements of autism, um, and I think yeah, just just the main thing I'd tell everyone is everyone with autism is, is different. So you know, don't treat everyone with autism like the same. Don't categorise them as, as the same, having the same traits, because they'll all be so different. Mm. From a parent's perspective, how do you describe it? So I have my own charity, more based around facial disfigurement, because um, Harry actually has a, a rare craniofacial condition as well, but he does have autism. So when I go into schools and I'm talking to the children, in explaining his behaviours, I sort of compare 
his brain and a typical brain to a, a Microsoft Windows PC and an Apple Mac. And I'll say they are both capable of doing incredible things, but they've got different motherboards. They're wired slightly differently. Um, so that's kind of where I start on a children's level. And I say, and I do say that people are affected in different ways. For Harry, I show them his stimming behaviours. I explain how his behaviours may present, how he may, you know, look quite strange and comical at times when he's flapping and and sort of banging and things like this. Um, and lots of the children will recognise those sort of behaviours. But for me, because of Harry's Golden Heart Syndrome, because he looks different, people often look at his autistic behaviours and then attribute it to the Golden Heart and they'll just think, oh, that, that explains it. So for me, it's really important when I'm talking to the children that they, that they may see a child in the middle of a meltdown, particularly around times like Christmas, when it is sensory overload, there's lots of noises, lots of stimulation that they just can't cope with and that they just take a minute to think, actually, that child might be an overwhelm rather than just being a naughty child. And so for me, I talk address address the labels around autism um, at that level rather than going into sort of neuro level um, explanations, which I'm sure you'd, you'd be much better at than me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, for me, it's important that people recognise that those behaviours they might see, particularly from children, they might be tempted to laugh and giggle and point and stare, but actually it could be a child in a lot of distress. And so it's about raising awareness for me and just explaining that you know, communication is affected and um, that I want Harry to be chatting with other children, but to understand that he might not have the, the ability to have communication back and have a conversation back. He's technically non-verbal, although a complete chatterbox. I don't know where he gets it from. Um, so, yeah, I kind of explain it that way, if that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, and has it changed from a, a professional's point of view, the way that you would describe? Um, I think the most sort of radical change we've had, if radical is the right word to use, is, is the kind of increased awareness and understanding of how important sensory needs are for people on the autistic spectrum. Um, and as, as you've just been saying, Alex, that could be sight, sounds, smells, the way things look, people's understanding of space in a room. You know, some people might struggle with this, for example, if you know, we've got four people sitting relatively close together, and that could be really quite difficult for some people. Um, so there could be all sorts of things within sort of environments that we now understand are much more important. And whilst there was a general recognition that sensory issues were sort of associated with the autistic spectrum, up until a few years ago, it was deemed to be sort of something that you may or may not see, but wasn't actually central to the diagnosis. Whereas now, classification systems really put sensory difficulties very much at the heart of a diagnosis, so which, which is really important because it really enables us to get a much better understanding of the child's strengths and needs and then obviously that leads into what kind of support that child might need particularly in classrooms for example where we can make much more um, you know much better informed adaptations to the environment to really support people so i think the biggest shift has really been around sensory difficulties the other aspects really remain the same really um, social interaction social communication those behavioral interests and, and, and sort of difficulties with as you say meltdowns and sensory overloads that's very much sort of still the kind of core features of autism, um, but obviously the way we understand that in the context of an individual is still our starting point. So whether we call it wiring or neurodiversity or individuality, it's still really just about trying to understand what the child actually is presenting with and what bits of their behavior might be about autism and how much is just that child being themselves. Mm. That's really interesting. Hey, and I, one of the things, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, hey, I see maybe a shift in describing uh, autism spectrum disorders to be a more uh, a kind of social representation of it rather than trying to put some clinical explanation to it. It's more about this is how it plays out in real life. Yeah. And I think the, uh, the Too Much Information campaign did well in doing that, in saying, in presenting children and uh, autistic people in different social and public situations, saying that may not be a naughty child that may be yeah. because of sensory issues and that too, that information processing so maybe that maybe the change is that people are starting to think twice when they see somebody with different behaviors to their own yeah, yeah. i think it takes a long time doesn't it it's, it's almost a generational thing that has to be passed down through conversation and awareness and i don't think awareness of any issue happens overnight it is about those ongoing conversations but i think we are moving in the right direction slowly but surely and I guess the other sort of 
technical shift I suppose we've seen in the sort of clinical world is, is the move away from using lots of separate labels and that recognition that actually whilst there is individuality there's also a lot of shared uh, characteristics for anyone on the autism spectrum and rather than trying to sort of put people into separate little boxes under the autism spectrum there's been a shift to actually just using that one label now rather than saying you know high functioning autism or childhood autism or you know Asperger's syndrome and I know that's a, obviously a label which obviously was was uh, you were diagnosed yeah. with Alex so and obviously people continue to use those descriptors but as we move forward I think having that sort of one label which describes everybody actually makes it a lot easier to then think about the individual rather than saying what kind of autism have you got because actually there's a lot of shared variability and it's really difficult to put people neatly into little boxes as we know because that you know, doesn't really work for human beings mm. so that having that one label to describe everybody and then understanding the individual makes it a lot easier I think. Yeah and you can draw comparisons to other conditions I guess you know personally I'm uh, epileptic and epilepsy is a broad uh, you know, there's lots of different types of it, but I've never really known what my type is. I'm just, you know, epileptic, uh, and I guess that's where where the shift is towards that kind of broad yeah. description, so people just accept that there may be things that they need to be aware of. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that change in uh, change in public perception um, also goes through to legislation and human rights and the rights uh, for for all people. And it's been ten years since the human right uh, the autism act was uh, passed so i'm interested to know um, from where we are now in another 10 years time what would you have liked to have seen changed and i think this is particularly one for charlie and alex um to to improve your rights and uh, anything in society that you think we need to look at over the next 10 years i think one of the things that i would always say is for instance when you go to for instance football matches there's always a certain number of seats that the, the clubs have to have for people in wheelchairs. Similarly, when I get the train, they've always got spaces for people with wheelchairs and ramps. But you never really see much in the way of sort of um, seats at football matches for autistic people or help on trains for autistic people. Because being a hidden disability, people don't always notice it. And obviously, people like say to me quite regularly, oh, I would never have known you had autism. Well, I always say to them jokingly, well, I would never have known you didn't have autism because it's not something that you can see. So I think I'd like there to be more sort of understanding and awareness and actually help and support put in place in everyday environments. So whether that be football grounds or shopping centers or supermarkets, just to, just to help people with autism to function in those environments a little bit better and make their experiences of say, going to a supermarket or going shopping that little bit easier. From my point of view, Harry is almost 14 now. So thinking of him as a 24-year-old is, A, terrifying. <laughs> um, and also I kind of think from employment and contribution perspectives, you know, what I want Harry to be able to live as independently as he possibly can. Um, at the moment, that's that doesn't happen. You know, I look after his personal care um, and he's in a special education and functioning around about four, three and a half, four years old. So his communication is very delayed, his understanding, his expressive language is very delayed opposed to his receptive language. He understands much better than he can express. Um, but I would, I would love to, to think that maybe in another 10 years he could have some sort of role in society where he was accepted and valued and contributing for him. I mean, that's, that's a huge ask for a child with Harry's complex needs. But I think that's what every mother wants for their child, regards their abilities or disabilities. And I think he deserves a chance. And what do you think needs to change to? Oof, wow, I don't know. That's a huge question. Mm. Legislation, um, employers, um, attitudes. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a bit of a minefield. I know there are some social enterprises around that, that support autistic individuals uh, and provide them specifically with jobs and roles within their companies and I think they are fantastic models that could be looked on as ways that could be incorporated into other companies as well. And again about breaking down barriers I think at the sort of higher functioning end of, of autism when people have got you know really quite you know strong skills that need to be maximised and give people the best employment opportunities I think you know some employers are really tuning into that now and I've got you know sort of apprenticeship schemes where they're specifically supporting people with autism um, so Deutsche Bank, I think, is one example. Unilever, you know, these are companies that are spotting that actually there's people that can make a fantastic contribution. 
And I think, you know, being able to maximise the benefits of that goes back to the early years of schooling. It's about identifying children as yeah. early as possible who may need additional support, but actually might have some real strengths and talents that just need nurturing and, and identifying. And that obviously then leads into employment and training opportunities yeah. down the line. So there's a whole sort of life life skills piece of work to be done there, I think. But Definitely. Um, there's no yeah. quick quick answer to that one, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a young man finding his way in the world, you're doing... Uh, great job carving your own way as a uh, speaker presenter um have you encountered any uh, barriers you know legislative or or any other social barriers that have stopped you maybe p pursuing a career in any way i mean from when i was first diagnosed at the time when when i you know i was first first diagnosed i had no idea what autism or asperger's was and to be honest my parents didn't really know much about it but the first thing that my dad said to me was this is or your your Asperger's is a positive thing. It gives you special powers, and a lot of our family have Asperger's traits because it can be passed on through families. So from that moment forward, I personally always viewed it as something positive. Yes, there have been a lot of struggles and stresses that I've had to deal with um, throughout my life, but there are also a number of positives, and those are the things that I like to focus on. For instance, you know, if I didn't have autism, would I be as confident as standing up in front of hundreds of people and then just speaking without feeling nervous at all? Um, but I think at school, there was a lot of, um, specifically, people who was, were working with me, like teachers, who didn't really understand autism and Asperger's that well. And in my own opinion, probably didn't really want to treat me any differently to everyone else, because it was probably slightly more difficult to try and treat me differently. So I think certainly in a, in a school sense, um, there needs to be a lot more ra awareness raised within schools, and, and fa because teachers are going to be... Um, most teachers are going to be come across working with people with Asperger's and with autism at some point during their professional careers. And I think um, even if they were just given like a little brief outline of what autism is and how to treat people and children with autism, I think it would make the, the people who they're working with, the children, um, have a, a much better experience at school. So uh, to kind of summarise over the next 10 years, I think we all want the heightened level of awareness to actually manifest itself in people really understanding how they need to adapt to to welcome people with uh, any kind of autism uh, uh, into their their own yeah on a practical level yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah. Hey, could there could there be similarities draw, drawn from kind of dyslexia where dyslexia is developed and now it's you know, yeah, it's the same thought process about oh. 10 minutes ago when you asked the question actually it's a very similar sort of model isn't it if we were to go back 30 years in terms of you know children with dyslexia at those times had very different labels attached to them and weren't given opportunities didn't get the right support and obviously then that can leads through into adulthood and not being able to pursue opportunities that they probably had every right to access to and so we now understand a lot more about dyslexia and it's identified and people get the right support much earlier and autism seems to be very similar in terms of that model you know it's about identifying people as early as possible to get the right support in place and making sure that we've got actually environments that really support and maximize people's strengths and abilities because often it's the the environment that's disabling and not the things that kids are actually bringing into the environment and if we can just make simple changes to provide the right support then children do extremely well you know it's about us thinking differently not training the child to be different and that's the key really and so we've got um legislation about to be passed through in terms of autism awareness training for professionals across the board, which would be another really positive step in that direction. So for teaching staff, obviously they now have um, a session on autism training as, as part of their core training, providing uh, autism awareness training to GPs, to social workers, to health workers, we really another another positive step forward. So things are moving in the right direction. And I think, yeah, getting it on the table and having that conversation and making people aware is really the best starting point. Great. And that, that uh, leads us on to kind of Cordwell Children's role uh, because we're here at in a in a small corner of the uh, new Cordwell International Children's Centre, uh, just ahead of our full launch in in not too long, a few weeks time, and uh, we've got uh, high hopes for being a part of those next ten years and being able to add value to uh, the kind of autism community and. Uh, add evidence to uh, any kind of research going on around autism intervention. So Matt, can you tell us a little bit more about what the plans are here at the centre? Okay, so um, obviously there are lots of 
added value points to being here. I could probably talk for quite a long time, but I'll try and keep it short and to the point. So I guess the first sort of unique selling point we've got here is, is the building that we're sitting in. You know, it, it's a fantastic space, purpose built and designed to meet the needs of children, young people and adults with, with autism. So it obviously provides a very enabling environment. It's, it's an environment which we can adjust and fit and mould around the needs of, of individuals, which means we can really get the best out of people when they actually come to us here. In terms of the services that we're currently providing within the building, we have a multidisciplinary assessment team in place to very, very quickly uh, provide an assessment diagnostic process for children and young people who are perhaps struggling to access services elsewhere because obviously we know that there are significant weights in parts of the country. We're also able to provide an assessment which is quite unique in terms of how we've put the service together. So sometimes families have to wait for appointments with different professionals and gather information from different professionals as part of that assessment process. And we're very conscious that that impacts on time and delays and it can take many, many months even when you've been referred for an assessment to actually get all that information together and get to the point of actually coming to that conclusion of does my child have autism or not. So we really wanted to address that by bringing all those bits together. So we have children and families in for a very short period of time but with all the, the disciplines working together around that child so we're able to put together information from occupational therapy, from speech and language, from psychology, from nursing, very, very quickly and efficiently so that we can put all that information together and give parents a diagnosis in a very, very timely and efficient way so they're not having to wait a long time, get reports back to parents very, very quickly and provide them some support straight away as well. So as you'll know as a parent, I'm sure, once you've received that diagnosis, support unfortunately is quite patchy, it's quite limited. Um, and that's something that we really wanted to address in the service that we've developed here. So we've really thought uh, long and hard about what the gaps are in the, in, in, um, in the market. We've worked with parents to get their feedback in terms of what support they would, they need and what the evidence base tells us parents really struggle with post-diagnosis. So we're able to provide support straight away um, in, in a range of different ways, lots of different workshops around the key issues that we know parents struggle with, whether that's behaviour, speech and language, coping skills, social skills. And also we've got sort of a golden thread that runs through the whole service. So right from the point of referral, we really wanted parents to have a, a contact point in the service so that they've got a go-to person and they're supported right from the point of referral through the assessment process and then to have follow-up as well. So even once we've actually finished that hands-on work with parents and children, giving them the sort of skills and strategies that they can take away and practice and develop, families will be able to have a contact um, with our family support team and that will continue for several months after so that they can go back and have a person to speak to to talk things through if they're struggling to follow through on the ideas, if they need some additional support or guidance. So there's always a contact point there from for sort of a 12 month period right from referral straight through, through the assessment process and follow up making sure that families feel really kind of contained and supported really with the outcome being hopefully that we give people some skills to go away with you know we don't want people to be dependent on us here the idea is that you know we support people to make the best of uh, the child's strengths we give them some ideas to manage the things that they're struggling with and then we let people go away and actually do that because they're the experts at the end of the day and we don't want families to be dependent on another service people can obviously come back if they need additional support down the line but it's really about empowering families to kind of make the most i love it <laughs> it gets me so excited i think being the other end of the, the sort of testing and diagnosis scale now sort of a few years afterwards and our experience was so very different to that you know it was a very typical experience that we had and I think the fact that parents are going to have access to such considerate, concise and quick, um, you know, within a real realistic timescale service with that ongoing support is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fabulous. I love it. So what, what was it like for you? Um, it was long. So I think it probably took, actually I say long, it probably took about 12 months in total which isn't as long as some parents have to wait. Some are waiting two, three years. Um, but it was very much about Harry being seen by different professionals in different contexts, then different meetings for us in different places. I remember at one time, um, I think I mentioned to you when we, we met, um, I was chatting to one of the psychologists and he was very keen to talk about what Harry couldn't do. 
Um, and I was sort of explaining to him that he'd got a real skill in playing the piano. So he was two, but he taught himself how to play certain tunes. And the, the um, psychologist just didn't believe what I was saying. And I had, thankfully had a little video on my phone and I had to show him. But I was almost fighting Harry's corner to say, you know, you can't write him off. Yes, he can't talk. Yes, he's got these sensory needs, but he's also got this skill. So you almost become embroiled in this fight early on to, to kind of stand up for your child with agencies that you assumed would help you anyway. Um, so that knocks your confidence. At the same time as you, as a parent, trying to get your head around this new world that you've maybe previously not encountered. Um, so yeah, it was a long process. There was lots of appointments in lots of different places, which in itself was overwhelming for Harry. Um, lots of conflicting information because they'd see him on different times and different occasions, in different settings. Uh, and it just made the process long and painful for all of us, really. Um, so yeah, to, to kind of have this service now from a perspective of a parent is amazing. Really, really good. And Alex, uh, you told me a little bit about uh, your assessment uh, earlier. What was it like for you? So for me, it was a similar timescale. Um, it took me about a year to get diagnosed. And I know a lot of my friends, it took a lot longer. So for, in some instances, um, I think one of my friends took up to three years to get diagnosed. So I was relatively quite quick in, in terms of what I know knew others, had, um, how long it had taken them to be diagnosed. But I always sort of looked upon it as I quite enjoyed the process because I didn't really understand why I was going to all these meetings and assessments um, but they kind of made me feel sort of clever and special in a way. And I told my parents that, you know, I want to go back and do more assessments um, because they made me, like, they, like I said, they, they made me feel special and clever. Um, and then when I got the diagnosis, it was quite a struggle for my parents um, to actually, the support to actually be put in place. So my dad, for instance, he had to do a lot of fighting um, to get me the support that I needed um, that should really have been put in place without him really needing to do anything. And I always say to people that it's only because my dad is able to, to fight for, or was able to fight for what I needed, that a lot of the support I got was actually put in place. Um, even if things were written for my statement, where I was allowed a certain length of time of extra additional support, a week or a day, that was very rarely put in, into place. And if I was meant to have, say, an hour of additional support a day, I was very rarely getting more than about 10 minutes. Um, but even the 10 minutes I was getting was purely because my dad was able to, to to fight for my, my, my corner um, and like I said I've always viewed it as something positive but at school there were so many different struggles and hurdles that I had to go through and my parents had to go over even when I was first diagnosed my dad had to bring someone into this into my primary school from the council uh, and they told the teachers look you need to treat Alex has now got autism and Asperger's you need to treat him differently to what you're treating other people because he's got extra additional needs that you need to support um, but in terms of the actual process of being diagnosed, compared to a lot of my friends, it, it was really quite straightforward and, um, for me, quite an enjoyable process, I, I found. Okay. Um, I think uh, we're, we're about ready to wrap up, but I'd like to... We've talked about the future for autism awareness and changing the, the landscape for, for people with autism. And I think we can start a little bit of that right now by you helping... Uh, our listeners who uh, who may be working in businesses or uh, or working in organisations where they don't know enough about autism and um, what would you say if uh, to somebody who is going to meet you for the first time that would really help break down any barriers? I think for anyone meeting someone who's got autism or Asperger's, I would just say you know be a bit more considerate. That person might need a bit more time to process the questions and answer them. You know, some of the things that you may be saying, some of the language you use, so you might be using sort of idioms or sarcasm or something. And I always find that really difficult to understand if someone's being sarcastic or certain what certain idioms and phrases mean. So I'd always say just, you know, try and be as direct as possible if you're speaking to someone with autism. Um, and also just be aware that, you know, they might not appear to be sort of engaging in the conversation, but they will be. It's just that they can engage in the conversation in a different way. So, you know, they might not be very good at keeping eye contact. Um, they might be staring into space or something, but they'll still be listening to your conversation and still be, you know, involved in that conversation. And Charlie, from uh, a parent's point of view, um, when you're with Harry, how would you like people to, how would you like it to change how people react to you? Um, we have the, obviously the extra complication of Harry's appearance. So people have to kind of get past that barrier first. 
Um, but I kind of want people to meet the person and not the label. So not bring those preconceived stereotype ideas because, you know, you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, and what works for one person won't always work for another. So I think it's about having that honest communication. And if people are able to articulate their needs, being open and being vulnerable enough to say, you are the expert in your condition. You tell me what works well for you. Do you need me to explain things a little bit slower? Do you need me to, you know, should I not be worried that you're not making eye contact? Uh, and so giving them, empowering them to be the person that leads the way without patronising them. Um, obviously in Harry's condition, Harry's situation is slightly different because people tend to talk through me. Um, but often it's about not talking over his head. So it's having a conversation with us both. So, you know, he is, even though he can't maybe express his language, he does take it all in. And often people will make this mistake of talking about him as if he's not there. So it's always a case of, you know, you talk to us both together. Harry is a central part of this conversation. Um, and just acknowledging that he's there and he's of value and needs to be respected, really. Great. Um, well, I think both of those uh, bits of advice will be really useful. Um, we can wrap up by saying a very big thank you to Matt, Charlie, Alex. Uh, I think it's important to say that uh, we're accepting referrals for the new service. So head to the Cordwell Children website and look at our autism service. We are accepting referrals for the, the full assessment pathway and our workshops. And uh, thanks again. Thank and well much. done for our first ever Cordwell Children podcast. Yay! <laughs>